I first heard of the case almost by chance. It was when the court issued a ruling protecting the jury from protesters who were going to be at the courthouse on behalf of Rosmia. And I just saw a report of that someplace, really by chance. And that's very unusual. It's not often that a court has to issue an order of protection for a jury. And so I started to look into it and became very interested in the case, became very interested in her story, and became particularly interested in how the anti-Israel movement in the U.S. was latching on to this case and using it as organizing uh, mechanism to try to get grassroots organizing and generate uh, protests and generate information and other activity. My own personal background is that while I wasn't political at all before the website, the one time I did get involved in these sort of disputes is when I was a student at Harvard Law School in the early 1980s. I graduated in 1984. And those were the early years of the anti-Israel movement. And we had some of that on campus. And a lot of the people who are now the leaders in academia of the anti-Israel movement were at Harvard Law School at that time. And I've seen repeated over the years the same pattern, the same attempt to portray the dispute in racial terms, that it's the so-called white Israeli Jews versus the people of color. That was a theme back in the early 1980s. That's not new. The attempt to co-opt other movements. At that time, they were trying to co-opt the American Indian movement. Uh, and that was their strategy. So a lot of the strategies that I saw playing out in the Razmia case were strategies I had seen anti-Israel activists use at Harvard Law School in the early 1980s. So that again increased my interest in the case because it's essentially the same tactics and the same people fast forward 30 years later. And so that's why I took an interest in the case. And obviously once I got into the merits of the case, then it became even more interesting to me. Legal insurrections goal in this case is really to get the truth out there. There has been so much propaganda from the anti-Israel side about this case at so many levels and so many lies that get repeated by supposedly respectable people, people in academia and elsewhere, that our goal is to get the truth out there. And because of that, we've done independent research, both legal and factual research. We've dug into records, and we've been able to put forward the evidence showing that virtually every talking point of the Razmia side is either outright false or highly questionable. And so that's our goal here, is to get the truth out there. The immigration fraud trial has to do with Razmia lying on her visa application in 1994 and her naturalization application in 2003. There were very specific questions that would not take any viewer by surprise. Have you ever been convicted or imprisoned for any crime? And there's two or three questions like that. And she answered no to those questions. Of course, that was a lie because she had been convicted in Israel in 1970 of a supermarket bombing which killed two people and of the attempted bombing of the British consulate, which they found the bomb before it went off. So she lied on her applications. As a result of those lies, she became a US citizen. So the prosecution in Detroit that's ongoing now has to do with whether she should be convicted of immigration fraud, obtaining naturalization by fraud, and what the consequence of that would be. Logically, the bombing itself, whether she did it or not, is irrelevant. The fact of the matter is she was convicted of it. The question on the immigration forms did not say, were you fairly convicted? Were you justly convicted? Should you have been convicted? It simply asked for a historical fact. Have you ever been convicted or imprisoned? Ever. Ever. In fact, on the naturalization form, I don't remember the visa form, it was capitals and bold, the word ever. And she lied on those forms. And it does, shouldn't matter for the immigration trial whether she actually did the bombing or not. She was convicted. It shouldn't matter whether her confession was the result of torture. Legally, it shouldn't matter because she was convicted. She had to reveal the conviction. She could have checked the box yes on the immigration forms and then given an explanation. I didn't do it. I was tortured. I falsely confessed. That's what she should have done. That would have been honest and lawful. 
but instead she lied. And we now we know, of course, why she lied, because she wouldn't have become a citizen and she, because the U.S. immigration would have looked into the case and they would have realized not only was she convicted, but that she was a member of the Popular Front for the Liberation of Palestine, a terrorist organization, in and of itself a ground to preclude her from coming into the country. So even if she never disclosed that, I think there's a question on there about being a member of a terrorist organization. She lied about where she was. One of the things that's very interesting is she wasn't simply this low-level political activist. She was not only the first female or one of the first female military members of the Popular Front for the Liberation of Palestine. She was so important in the movement that after she was arrested and convicted, a brigade was formed called the Razmia Ode Brigade, meant to hijack planes and do other things to try to gain her release and the release of others. That brigade was led by a very famous terrorist, Leila Khalid who was the first female plane hijacker. So Razmia Ode was a very prominent member of a terrorist group. During the 1972 Munich massacre at the Olympics, when the Israeli athletes were taken hostage, the uh, hostage takers issued a list of people they demanded be released from Israeli prison. Razmia Ode was on that list. So this is not somebody as portrayed by her supporters who just happened to be a political activist swept up, randomly chosen. The, the clear history available to anybody who chooses to do the research is that she was a prominent terrorist and she was convicted um, after not only others corroborated her testimony and testified against her, she corroborated it. If she gave a false confession. How is it that all of the details of her confession were borne out by the forensic evidence in terms of where the bomb was placed, all those other things? They found bomb making material in her room at her father's house. And interestingly, the Israelis didn't prosecute the father. They reached the determination that he was unaware of what his daughter had in her bedroom. Now, if the Israelis were so unfair why wouldn't they have prosecuted the father? If all they wanted to do was prosecute innocent Palestinians, why didn't they prosecute the father? Because they investigated fairly. They determined that the bomb-making material in Razmia's room was not known to the father, and they didn't prosecute him. So I think this whole history of Razmia portrayed by her supporters is a complete fabrication. The lying on those forms was not just about her conviction. And that's another reason why what happened in Israel in 1969 really is not relevant to this trial. What's relevant is her multiple lies on her immigration forms, the result of which was that she became a U.S. citizen. Razmia went to trial in November 2014, was prosecuted. The jury took all of two hours to find her guilty of immigration fraud. The judge even found in his sentencing that she committed perjury uh, when she told her story about not understanding the questions and this cockamamie theory about that ever didn't mean ever, etc. Uh, she was sentenced to 18 months in prison to be followed by deportation. She then appealed, and the appeal concerned the fact that the trial court in the original trial did not allow her to present expert testimony that she suffered from post-traumatic stress syndrome and that disorder and that uh, had she been a that she should have been able to do that she appealed that the sixth circuit federal court of appeals partially reversed it upheld everything the trial court had done except said you know what judge you should have had the hearing on whether there should be an expert the court actually ended up not holding a hearing based just on the affidavits and the papers submitted said there's enough here that she should at least be allowed to present that defense and therefore she gets a new trial. Judge never ruled that the defense was valid. There's a big difference between being able to present it in court and whether it's actually holds up in court. So all that happened is she was granted a new trial so she could present this unique and very unusual post-traumatic stress disorder 
theory, which is she didn't, that she didn't block out the memories of the bombing and the memories of her conviction, but she filtered the questions in such a way because of her claim of 25 days of sexual torture. Very unusual, but the court said it's enough. It, it passes that low bar to get her to present it in court. And of course, the prosecution was going to call witnesses who would say, this is not a valid theory. There's no evidence to support it in her case, and that there's no evidence to support that that actually happened, that she filtered the questions. So it was going to be contested. What's very important is that since she was granted the new trial, the prosecution filed what they call a superseding indictment. So it's no longer simply non-disclosure of a prior conviction. That would have been enough. They have now have included non-disclosure of her membership in a terrorist organization, Popular Front for the Liberation of Palestine, as well as having engaged in acts of terror. So it's a broadened factual basis supporting still a single charge. That, I believe, is why she is pleading guilty, because Unlike the first trial, when the prosecution didn't really get in very much about what she had done, other than the fact that she was convicted, the second trial, because she asserted this ludicrous post-traumatic stress defense, was going to be much broader. The prosecution was actually going to prove that she was a terrorist, that she was a member of a terrorist organization, and that she had, in fact, committed acts of terrorism, including but not limited to the supermarket bombing. So this new upcoming trial was going to be very different than the first one. In the second one, in the new trial coming up, the prosecution was going to prove that she was what they've always claimed, a terrorist who hid her terrorist past. And that new trial, therefore, was much greater threat to her because she's built her entire life narrative, her entire narrative as a social justice warrior around having been innocent and wrongly convicted in Israel of engaging in terrorism. She presents herself and her supporters do as being simply a political activist swept up by the Israelis and made a scapegoat for the bombing. In fact, the prosecution was going to prove that she was guilty uh, as charged in Israel, that she was a terrorist, that she was a member of a terrorist organization. And once that got laid bare in court, public court in the United States, all of her supporters were going to look like the fools that they are. They were going to be exposed and she was going to be exposed as being a fraud. And so I think that that case, she pleaded, she's pleading guilty because she understood what was going to happen at the trial. Whatever else she is, I think she's a very smart woman. And I think she, she correctly assessed the risks to her. She did not believe the BS that her supporters spout. She understood that she was guilty. She understood she was going to get convicted. She understood that she was going to get at least 18 months, probably longer, and she took the deal. So I think she's a very smart woman. She's a smart woman, though, who lied to get into the country. I've spoken to many of the family members, and I've met the family most of whom are in Israel. And obviously this is very hard for them because they lost their sibling. The parents are long dead. Remember, Edward um, Yaffe and Leon Kanner were 21 years old in 1969. Their siblings are now in their late 60s and 70s. The parents are long gone. And they've had to live their entire life. I met the family in Israel, and it was absolutely heartbreaking. You'd think the death took place last week, not over 40 years ago. And the way families deal with it, they deal with it very differently. I think in any circumstance, and certainly here, uh, the one thing that became very clear to me is that those deaths never went away. They were always there every single day. And I've met the siblings, and it really is heartbreaking. It's difficult because they know that what is being claimed is not true by the Razmia supporters. And it's very hard for them to hear it. And they see a court system which bends over backwards, as it should, to protect her rights. But nobody protected their brother's rights. Edward's mother produced a video when she thought she was going to die, and she did die two weeks later. 
and she said that all of the joys in her life have been overshadowed by the death of Edward. I mean, how can you not get emotional about that? I do think that this, for the readership, has also become a bigger issue than just the conviction of Rosmia Ode, because they see how the system can be manipulated and how false narratives can be portrayed by people who are frankly their political opponents. And they appreciate the fact that somebody is coming forward and, and contesting that. So I think for the readership, this is a bigger issue too of whether the truth can prevail over this propaganda machine that has been built up around Razmiya Ode. The anti-Israel movement in the U.S. has made Razmiya into a figure around whom they are organizing. So student groups around the country, Students for Justice in Palestine, which is an anti-Israel group, at their various campuses are organizing events and protests on behalf of Razmiya. Various groups like uh, Palestine Legal and uh, Jewish Voice for Peace, which is an anti-Israel group, and other groups like that are using Razmiya as an organizing figure because she tells this compelling story of torture, of horrific tor torture. They want, they like that story to put Israel on trial and portray Israel in a bad way. And therefore, she becomes the organizing tool. Is this something she's cooperating in? Based on what I observe publicly, yes. She goes places, she talks, she appears, she urges people to support her. So I think she's a full participant in this. This is her political moment. She also is using this to ingratiate the anti-Israel movement into the Black Lives Matters movement. She is the, a person who gives speeches and goes around places saying that what's happening to me, what's happening to Palestinians, is no different than what happens to black youth and black young men in inner cities, abuse by the police, etc., etc. And that's a really heavy push in the anti-Israel movement now, so-called intersectionality, that what happens to different people of color at the hands of white power structure is the same in Israel-Palestine as it is in Detroit or Ferguson or Chicago. Of course, there's a lot of fallacies about that. One actually has nothing to do with the other, but it's a narrative for which Razmiya is something of a perfect fit. And therefore, I think she knows what she's doing. She encourages it. It's, she is, I, based on what I've seen publicly of her, and her speeches and things like that. I think she's a full participant in this movement. I also believe that her defense team realizes this could be helpful to her. That's why they send protesters to the courthouse. Really kind of unheard of. They send people to pack the courtrooms. They did it in the appeals court and they do it in the trial court because what they want is they want a jury to see that she's got all these supporters and they want a judge to know that they can mobilize hundreds of people to protest at the drop of a hat. That's why this judge took the extraordinary measure of protecting the jury from protesters. The jury was um, to meet off-site and then be brought in a van to the courthouse so they would not have to walk through the gauntlet of Razmiya protesters, who would of course be shouting a lot of things that are not gonna be come into evidence in the case. So this is a very organized thing. Razmiya is has become a figurehead for a, a movement which wants to portray uh, Arabs treatment in Israel, Arab treatment in the US, and compare it to treatment of blacks in the US and other minorities. None of this is in error and the f they're using it as a mobilizing tool. So she has become a useful tool for a lot of people who have anti-Israel agendas. And so those people, I think, understand very well that what they're saying about her is not true, but it doesn't matter because she's useful to them. They portray her as simply a peaceful political activist who is swept up in a roundup of 500 people and almost randomly was picked to be uh, the target of this prosecution in Israel in 1970. 
In fact, we have found books written about Razmia uh, by pro-Palestinians portraying the struggle of women uh, in Palestine. And she is highlighted in those books as being the first or one of the first military members of the Popular Front for the Liberation of Palestine, which was a terrorist group before she was arrested by the Israelis. So this is not somebody based on what we were able to find through Googling and searching online, who is not somebody who is just a political activist. She was a terrorist, a member, a military member of a terrorist organization. And that's just one example of what we have found that completely debunks what she says. If you would listen to the Razmia supporters, in the U.S. at least, they would suggest that this was essentially a rubber stamp trial. It wasn't a fair trial. They'll even go so far as to say she wasn't even allowed to have a lawyer. In fact, she had a lawyer. The lawyer is photographed and pictured in these Jerusalem Post stories with Razmia. And um, in fact, they quote a representative of the International Red Cross who sat in on the trial and who stated publicly at the end that he thought it was a fair trial, an observer from the International Red Cross. Her story is that she was arrested and that she was tortured for 25 days, and very horrific torture if it happened, and that it was only at the end of that 25 days of torture that she finally confessed, and it was a false confession, and that was the sole basis upon which she was convicted. In fact, what the records show is that she confessed the day after she was arrested and that she had multiple confessions in that first 10 days. And she also, I've learned through the government briefs filed in the case, led investigators to the scene and to other places that first week or 10 days. She turned in other people, allowed the Israelis to essentially sweep up the whole operation based on what she said. And that was all within the first week to 10 days. So that just historically, factually, puts the lie to her claim of 25 days of torture. Now, I've never taken a position, and I still don't, whether she was tortured or not. But I do take the position that the historical record shows that her story of only confessing after 25 days of torture is not true. I've always had a theory of why she said that. Again, I'm not taking a position on whether she was tortured. But she was the first or one of the first female military members of the PFLP, Popular Front for the Liberation of Palestine. It would have looked very bad for her if she confessed within a day, if she turned in other people, if she led the police to various locations where they got more evidence, if she had just done that uh, under normal police questioning. And if you look back at the, the trial record from Israel, the um, investigator, one of the investigators, and I've put this on my website, said that she was an easy nut to crack. As soon as she realized other people were confessing, she confessed. So-called prisoner's dilemma that a lot of people talk about. Do you hold out if you think somebody else is going to spill the beans before you? And so that really puts, you know, the lot. So it's always been my view that she had to tell the story of the 25 days of torture to maintain her credibility within the terrorist organization. And in fact, we see that playing out today. The reason she's held out to be so credible is that she did suffer for so long. And so I think there is a reason for her to become this victim, this public victim, so that when she does get sent back, if she does get sent back, she is treating as a returning hero, not as somebody who after 24 hours turned in all her compatriots. I think she legitimately is upset that she's going to have to leave the United States, that the fruit of the lies on her immigration forms is being taken away from her, her U.S. citizenship. So I believe she really is upset. But just because she's upset doesn't mean she's been wronged. She was not wronged by the U.S. government in prosecuting her. She, she committed a wrong. Rather than acknowledging what she did, and acknowledging how she lied to come into the country, she presents herself as the victim. And once she admits what she did, which she probably will do once she leaves the United States, then I think that she uh, will see the real Razmia come out. The Twitter hashtag that Razmia supporters use is justice for Razmia. And I think 
when she pleads guilty, when the court accepts that plea, when she's deported and stripped of her citizenship, I think justice will have been done for Razmir.